record. And now I'm just going to ask, does anybody mind being recorded? Because if anybody minds, I won't do it. OK, then with that, um, I'll turn it over to the judges and you can proceed with a round. Good luck to uh, all the debaters. All right, and with that, I think we're ready to start. Yep, absolutely. So opponents, are we all here? I think, I think everyone's here. So I'm just gonna get started and introduce myself. So my name is Rhea Jane. I will be the first speaker for the government side in today's debate. We are from Washington High School. I am going to paste the um, resolution in the chat really quickly. Um, with that, I have seven minutes and my time starts now. Renee and I affirm the resolution that NATO should admit Ukraine as a member state. We believe this is a policy round due to the word should in the resolution and the presence of an actor and an action. Now, just to define one term really quickly, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a, a group or a body made up of several states in the North Atlantic and the United States and Canada, which is attempted at uh, attempting to create security and foster a defense alliance. All right, let's move on to the weighing mechanism in this round. Because it's a policy round, we believe that you should evaluate this based on net benefits, which is the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. All right, now that that's been established, let's jump into the first contention, which is safety. The first point here is that Ukraine and Russia have had a historically bad past. Due to the time of the USSR or in the Cold War, Russia viewed Ukraine as part of its country. And since then, Ukraine has gained its independence, but Russia is still angry and believes that Ukraine should belong to Russia. And, it, and because of this, Russia keeps trying to impose dominance over Ukraine in order to get back what is rightfully theirs. The biggest example of this is in 2014, when Russia annexed or took away the territory of Crimea from Ukraine thus saying, hey, this is my territory now, it's not yours. Let's go to the second point, which is trade harm. Since it annexed Crimea, Russia has continued to demand more and more. The following week, Russia opened fire on three Ukrainian naval ships, impounded them and detained their soldiers, some of them wounded. It then blocked the strait to Crimea by putting a tanker underneath the new bridge it had built to the Russian mainland. What does this mean? This means when Russia puts its ships into the same harbor, which is near Crimea, it is saying, this harbor belongs to me now, and I'm not afraid to take it away from you. Not only is, is this harmful, but Russia has also shown that it is willing to impose military force to get what it wants, as we saw that it hurt these Ukrainian soldiers in the process. What's the problem with this? Let's move on to the third point, which is that the Ukrainian military is not advanced in the status quo. Ukrainian ground forces have barely 2,000 battle tanks compared to Russia's 21,000, and they only have they have zero submarines or aircraft carriers. In total, Ukraine's military is only approximately one fifth the size of Russia, which means in the case of a Russian attack to Ukraine, Ukraine is pretty much defenseless. The fourth point here is the most concerning, which is that. Right, right now, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, wants to attack. In April 2021, Russia amassed over 100,000 troops on, east, on Ukraine's eastern border, and they blockaded parts of the Black Sea, restricted airspace near Crimea, etc. This snap buildup proves that Moscow can immediately mobilize its forces on a short notice, and the West can't even do about anything about it right now. Additionally, Vladimir Putin recently published an essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. He argues that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people. Ukraine has fake borders and that we should not be allowing Ukraine to be away from the West in fear. This all proves that he simply wants Russia and Ukraine to get back together and he will not stop until he gets that. Let's go to the links. If what happens when Ukraine is able to join NATO as a member state? Suddenly, we see a light in the darkness. NATO is able to support Ukraine, and it will not simply allow them to get thrown to the wolves of Russia. 
Why? Ukraine has a huge defense program with billions being poured in to protect its member states. And you might be asking, well, how do we know that NATO will protect its member states? Remember, NATO is a defensive military alliance, and its whole purpose is to protect these people from harm. Even originally, the plan for NATO was to defend against the USSR, which is why we know they're effective. Here are a couple of examples. In 1999, NATO was the one who stepped in and stopped mass killings in Kosovo due to the, due to the Kosovan government killing its own citizens. In 1995, NATO helped end the war between Bosnia and Herzegovina um, after, after being subject to attack. There are countless more examples that I can read off, but for now, I just want you to stick with me when I tell you that NATO is there for the safety and well-being of its members. Let's go to the impacts. First, we can see an increase in trade with NATO and Ukraine. This is because when Russia isn't able to blockade Ukraine anymore, it has access to the same ports it was missing out of. Second of all, we save lives and we improve the quality of life for these Ukrainian soldiers who are getting killed and getting harassed on the borders of Russia and Ukraine. That being said, let's jump to our second advantage, which is the economy. Right now, Ukraine is in an economic crisis. The economic growth of Ukraine is slowing due to COVID-19 and the total GDP fell by 0.7%. Additionally, this is also due to a lack of trade between Ukraine and other neighboring countries such as NATO. The second point is oil. Gazprom is a Russian oil company that the government has a monopoly over, a tool of economic warfare other countries rely on. But the problem is that multiple times over the past 20 years, Russia has cut away access, Ukraine's access to gas and oil from the company Gazprom, and they are planning on cutting their gas supply entirely. This is really key because this means that at any moment, at a moment's notice, Russia can simply cut off all access to oil and gas supply lines and thus hurt Ukraine's economy and cause it to go into a recession once more. Let's go to the links. A permanent presence in NATO would be a powerful deterrent to Russia, telling them they need to stop hindering trade. Thus, Russia will not cut off Ukraine's oil supply because they will face backlash from NATO. But even if they do, Ukraine can always rely on trading with the countries in NATO to help them get oil. This means that we need to give them a plan B, which is their new allies, NATO. This leads me to the second link, which is trade. NATO offers Ukraine the ability to stimulate trade and stimulate their economy. And this would be beneficial to both sides. Let's go to the impacts. When Ukraine joins NATO, we can see that Ukraine's economy is saved because now they no longer have to face a recession after Russia completely kicks out their oil and gas supply. And second of all, this will also boost the economy of the respective NATO countries who also depend on Russia and thus will make all of them less dependent on Russia and more co-dependent on each other. For all of these reasons and more, I strongly urge an affirmative ballot. Thank you. Do we have a minute of cross? Yes. Okay. Yes. So all right, I'm starting my cross time now. Okay, so what's preventing Ukraine and the status quo from actually trading with other countries for oil other than Russia? Well, right now, like we, like we stated, Ukraine already has this supply line set up with Russia, and they're really dependent on it. Right, so, so what's preventing them from just trading with another country in the status quo, like you say would be better? Um, ideally, nothing, but the problem is Ukraine isn't trading with them in the status quo because they're afraid that if they do that, Russia will just simply cut off their supply line. Um, okay. And then so for your point about um, uh, for your point about how the West isn't doing anything right now, how would you respond to the fact that the United States has already given substantial aid to Ukraine to aid in the Russo-Ukraine conflict in the Crimea region? So like the West is already doing a lot. So why well, does Ukraine need to be not an actual question. So why does Ukraine why does Ukraine need to be part of NATO if we're already giving aid? See, here's the problem. If the United States truly was giving enough military aid to Ukraine, we wouldn't be in this situation right now. Okay. As you can see, we're obviously in this conflict. And additionally, okay. I would argue that it's even better if they join NATO because the United okay. States is just one country, but NATO is a whole group of countries which can help Ukraine. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
All right, we're ready for the second speech. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, okay. So my roadmap for this speech, judges, is going to be uh, the negations, disadvantages to the affirmations plan, and then direct line-by-line -line refutation of the affirmations case. Yes? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so with that out of the way, I will start my time in three, two, and one. Hello, judge. My partner and I stand on the firmest negation of the resolution resolved. NATO should admit Ukraine as a member state. Judge, we agree with the framing of this round as a policy round. We agree with the framing of net benefits. We believe that the affirmation actually does much more harm than they are claiming, and that, therefore they do not uphold this value of net benefits. The negation does. Uh, let's go into a couple of disadvantages. The first is escalated military tensions with Russia. Russia's foreign ministry spokesperson, spokesperson gave a very, very specific re reason for the country's moves at the beginning of the military buildup that the affirmation was talking about, right? The affirmation tells us all about this 100,000 number of troops, right? That uh, that that was mobilized by Russia. The reason why Russia did this, and this is directly from Russia's foreign ministry spokesperson, they said this was because Ukraine's bid for the NATO's membership could entail irreversible consequences for the Ukrainian statehood. So again, the reason why they put the troops there is because Ukraine put in a bid for NATO. What does this tell us? That Russia is very, very likely to escalate military tensions when they see the potential for Ukraine to join NATO. This is directly from the Russian government. Preventing Ukraine from joining NATO is one of the is one of the Russian Federation's key geopolitical objectives, and it is certainly one that it is willing to use military force to achieve. Ukraine becoming a member of NATO would be a red line for China or, or for Russia, right? Russia does not want this to happen. Let's look into some history here. Carnegie Europe tells us that by admitting Ukraine, the alliance of NATO would would gain a massive conflict that regularly flares up, but in the status quo has quelled itself. So what we see right now is that tensions have, uh, military tensions have uh, 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 fallen to the lowest point in a long time. And so what we see here is that membership in NATO for Ukraine would not help the, uh, would not help end the war, but it would actually encourage Russia to escalate this conflict in this region. Let's look to the impacts here. The overall number of confirmed deaths in in the Russo-Ukrainian War in Donbass, which uh, started in uh, 2014, has been about 13,000 people. Russia will have absolutely no problem rekindling this detrimental conflict, killing thousands of people in the process, right? So you can just look to the fact that whatever the affirmation tells us about like how bad this conflict has been, they are essentially escalating this conflict. They are actually provoking Russia into inflaming tensions even more, tensions that do not uh, that have quelled themselves in the status quo. But the second impact here, Judge, is the economy. Ukraine is currently the poorest country in Europe. Escalating tensions with Russia will only lead to not only more Russian aggression, but also Russian expansion, more economic and humanitarian devastation in this region, which is already suffering economically. We can see massive economic devastation in this region as a result of the affirmation. But the second uh, disadvantage here is the detriment to NATO. Uh, let's go to the first sub point, and that is a focus on the Crimea region and focusing on uh, the Russia-Ukraine relations would detriment NATO. Sure, Ukraine would be inside this alliance under the affirmation, but this would only give Russia an excuse to act more aggressively. In turn, NATO would have to uh, devote all of its attention to this conflict. Admitting Ukraine to NATO means that even if Russia did something minor in Donbass or Crimea, it would be forcing the United States or forcing some other country to intervene. And we simply do not need a war between four different nuclear armed powers, the United States, Ukraine, um, uh, Russia, and other countries, right? Russia is not going to be deterred heard by this conflict. They are not afraid of NATO, right? They will only escalate this conflict. The ongoing conflict with Russia, as well as Ukraine's political, economic, and military shortcomings make membership unacceptable uh, right now for NATO, because not only does it detriment Ukraine, but also this alliance. Now, Judge, let's go into um, 
some key uh, observations and line by line refutation. So let's go into the framing again. We agree with the framework of net benefits. Let's go into their first contention. They talk about safety. They tell us that Ukraine has a uh, historically bad past with Russia. Judge, turn this contention and uh, you can essentially cross apply most of our disadvantages here. Uh, understand that military tensions have historically been bad. What does this mean? 13,000 people died in the war that was started in 2014. Russia has no problem rekindling that conflict when Ukraine does this one thing that Russia doesn't want it to do. I take you back to the uh, first point that I bring up, right? Russia's foreign ministry spokesperson gave a very clear reason as, as to why there was a military buildup. It was because Ukraine put in a bid for NATO. This is the one thing that is going to escalate Russia, and Russia has literally said this themselves. But further, it is, uh, again, it is one of Russia's key geopolitical objectives to keep Ukraine out of Russia, and it is definitely going to use military force to do this. So we are only killing more Ukrainians and only worsening the Ukrainian economy. So that's, this idea that it's going to help Ukraine in any way just doesn't stand. This entire contention is turned uh, in uh, in this debate. But next they talk about um, how NATO is going to like keep Ukraine safe. Judge, I take you again to this, uh, to our second contention this time. The idea that like, what we will end up ha having here is even if Russia is accept or sorry, Ukraine is accepted into this alliance, one, Russia will be acting more aggressively, which means that NATO is going to uh, nearly be completely devoted to this conflict. What that means is there are going to be four nuclear armed powers that are involved in this conflict, Judge. That is a massive, massive detriment, right? The involvement of Ukraine and NATO essentially allows for the proliferation of this conflict. Not only do we have massive Ukrainian death, but we also see that now there are four nuclear powers that are involved in this conflict that is escalating to a massive nuclear catastrophe. That is a massive, massive harm on the affirmation judge. But next, their point is about the Ukrainian economy. They talk about how uh, the economy is falling apart. Judge, again, you have to turn this point because the affirmation is actively making this worse with the economic devastation that they cause through the, uh, the involvement of Russia and the aggression of Russia in this region. But the next point they bring up, Judge, is that Russia is currently cutting off or has the ability to cut off all access to oil and gas. Well, first of all, Judge, we question how does the affirmation even solve for this um, the access that Russia has to oil and gas. First of all, Russia has a history of not cooperating with NATO uh, and has no reason to stop cutting off this, um, stop cutting off um, this um, oil and gas, right? Uh, historically, NATO has invited Russia to co cooperate on missile defense and has inv invited it in many other treaties. Russia has always not cooperated. They do not cooperate with NATO. So first of all, Russia doesn't have an incentive to cooperate with NATO. But second of all, Ukraine, as my partner mentioned in the cross period, Ukraine has the ability to trade for oil and gas elsewhere. It is not necessary that they trade with Russia. But this, this point essentially is wash uh, at the point where they cannot tell us on the affirmation that NATO can solve for this idea, right? So the, the point about the economy simply doesn't stand, one, because they cannot solve for the impact that they try to claim for oil and gas, but two, because they are literally destroying the Ukrainian economy by causing widespread economic devastation by proliferating this conflict with Russia. For all of these reasons, you vote on the negation. Thank you. All right, I just have a couple of questions to ask you. Okay. Let's start with my biggest question. So you mentioned that the reason that 100,000 troops, you know, went to the border and everything is because Russia is afraid of Ukraine joining NATO. So my question is this, why? So what we tell you is that this foreign ministry spokesperson did this because they do not want Ukraine to yeah. join. Why do they not want Ukraine to join NATO? have a history of not like cooperating with NATO. They have an ad an ad adverse relationship with NATO. But why Ukraine specifically? Why is it Ukraine and not all of these other states that they're mad about joining NATO? I think you answer it in your own case because one, they've historically tried to claim Ukraine as their own. And when they have this this feeling of ownership over this country, they have that adverse like gotcha you know, relationship. And so what we see as a result of that is that they do not want this to happen. And by allowing it to happen, you actually make things worse for Ukraine as we outline in our case. Right. 
So if if Ukraine can currently, so my second question is, if Ukraine can currently trade with the United States and NATO and everyone else, why aren't they doing this right now? So as my partner brings up, Ukraine is actually receiving a lot of aid from the United States in the status quo, but further than so, so what exactly is trade and not aid? Yeah, so the point about trade, you guys say that, oh, Russia like can cut off oil and gas and stuff. But the thing is, Ukraine can easily trade with another country in the event of that happening. So like that is not like a... So are you saying Ukraine, Russia has never cut off oil and gas to Ukraine? What I'm saying is that your guys' impact is potential. You're saying that Russia can cut off all access to oil and gas. And in the event of that happening, Ukraine has the ability to uh, trade with another country. All right, cool, thank you. All right, I'm gonna be the second speaker on the affirmation. I'm gonna go on the neg case and then the app case. Pretty simple. Actually, my laptop is about to die, hold on. Wait, sorry, really quick before you start, how much time did you guys record for Cross? I recorded. What was that? Oh, sorry. Judge, did you say something? I captured about a minute 45. Okay. I'm not sure if anybody else had a time around that. Okay. Okay. Yep, uh, neg case, af case, I have eight minutes, my time will begin now. So judges, let's do an overview of this round. My opponents have conceded that Russia does not want Ukraine to join NATO. Why? This is because Russia knows that if Ukraine joins NATO, they will become more powerful and be able to fight back against any sort of aggression that Russia throws at them. This is key because it means that Russia literally wants to have complete control and power over NATO right now. We cannot let Russia get what it wants by leaving Ukraine to the dust and not having them any, any sort of defense through NATO, 30 other member states being in alliance with them, they need the support of these other countries in order to fight against Russia. Now let's go on this first disadvantage where they talk about escalating military tensions. Judges, let's look at this contention here. They admit that right now Russia is willing to attack Ukraine at no, like, look with 100% certainty, but they're also admitting that it's going to occur later on. We should be preventing it as soon as possible. And the only way to do that is by joining NATO and giving them the defense that they need. They say that a spokesperson for Russia gave them reason for wanting to attack Ukraine even more, but Russia is going to attack Ukraine no matter what. And would you prefer Russia attacking Ukraine while they're completely defenseless, having extra, like, a very low military, no other allies? allies, no one to support them, they're going to be completely annexed just like Crimea was, or would you at least rather them have the protection of 30 other NATO member states? Then they say that the reason why Ukraine is a bidding for NATO's membership could lead to even more consequences. But this is just proof that Russia right now wants more power over Ukraine. If we do nothing, Ukraine is going to be succumbing to all this Russian aggression, all this power that's happening right now. NATO was formed to directly oppose Russia. This means that Russia knows if anyone joins within NATO, there's no point in trying to fight against them because they're outnumbered 30 to 1. Then they said the alliance of NATO would equal conflict. But judges don't buy this. The tensions are increasing right now and they're doing nothing about it. Then they said that there are 13 deaths occurring from Russia trying to annex different countries and that this is going to repeat. But no, these 13,000 deaths will only repeat themselves right now. Now in the status quo, Russia is jumping on the opportunity of taking over Ukraine once again. We cannot wait any longer and let these lives be lost. Then they say that these escalating tensions are somehow going to lead to Russian expansion. But how can Russia expand if 30 of their enemies in the region, plus one with Ukraine, are actively working against them? No one is going to want to work with them. No one is going to want to trade to them. If Ukraine decides that they no longer want to get oil from Russia and they switch on to NATO instead, then that means that Russia is only going to be losing out. Now, how are they going to expand in the world of the negation? Now, with that, let's go into their second disadvantage where they talk about a detriment to NATO. I just want to do an overview here. There is absolutely zero detriment 
to NATO when it comes to saving lives. We are the only side that is taking the step to defend Ukraine from the aggressiveness of Russia. And the only way that we can do that is by joining NATO physically. Now, NATO is not going to be losing anything. And if they do lose anything, it would only be money and military, which are not impacts that should be evaluated before death. Saving lives should be the number one thing that we look at here. Now, they say that we're forcing other countries like the U.S. to intervene in this conflict because the conflict is going to be so big. But my opponents here are contradicting themselves. First, they say that in cross-sex, the United States is intervening and helping Ukraine right now, but then they say that the United States is going to intervene later on once they join NATO and that there's going to be a conflict. They're only proving to you that whether or not the U.S. joins, Russia will be outnumbered. There are tons of countries against them. The United States has the biggest military in the entire world. How is Russia going to fight against that? That only means that there are dozens against one. Why are they going to harm Ukraine? At the end of the day, judges, between the negation and the affirmation, my opponent's worst impact on their case is Russian expansion, which is extremely improbable. We are already telling you here that Russia is trying to hurt Ukraine, killing people in the the status quo right now. It is not just because of NATO. And we are also telling you that Ukraine's economy is taking a hit, not be, uh, because Russia is being helped uh, and it needs to be needs the help from NATO in order to improve its economy because Russia is cutting off its oil supply. It's cutting off its ability to grow and to stimulate its economy. So thus, we are the only ones who are truly able to access the impacts of quality of life, of the economy, of solving for poverty, and most importantly, the deaths that are being caused right now. Now let's go into the affirmation case. Let's do an overview on this first advantage where we talk about safety. My opponents basically argue that we're going to turn all these impacts and that somehow we're going to become more unsafe. But Ukraine will become a more safe country as a member of NATO with the de defense, with the military, with the tanks, with the weapons, all the things that NATO comes with. Being on their side is simply going to be better for Ukraine than with Russia. We already know, my opponents have conceded, that Russia is obsessed with control, with power, with taking over this tiny country. And we are just sitting around and letting that happen. We're waiting for the day that that happens. We need to arm up. We need to make sure that they're sticking with NATO so that in the event that that in inevitable day comes, NATO will be able to protect Ukraine from that happening. Now, they say that Russia has no problem with just hurting Ukraine over the tiniest little thing. But what do you think is better, having the rest of you, NATO have to save Ukraine or leaving them completely defend defenseless on their own? And I want to extend the second uniqueness point where we talk about the trade harms that because because you know, Russia has annexed Crimea, it's only going to want more and more. It's delaying Ukraine ships, costing tons of money to their economy. My opponents barely have any responses here, but we're going to be extending this because even without the risk of Ukraine joining NATO, Russia will still attack Ukraine no matter what. It will annex its territory no matter what. It will kill its people and it will do anything that it needs to do in order to gain control over this country. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to stick with the negation? which is defending the status quo, doing nothing in the world, or are we defending a world in which we're at least taking the first step to arm ourselves and defend ourselves? Now let's go on to these other arguments here on the second disadvantage, where we talk, or advantage, sorry, where we talk about the economy. Russia is killing the economy of Ukraine. They're cutting off access to oil. They're not allowing the people to trade. They're saying that we're only going to be making this worse. But judge, they're only misunderstanding this argument. Our argument is that if Ukraine can go go to NATO, they're going to have access to different sources of oil, and they will no longer have to rely on Russia. This means that Russia is no longer going to have control over them and can't decide, hey, today I don't want to give you oil. I'm going to destroy your economy today. Instead, they get the power to do that themselves. And the reason that it's not occurring in the status quo is because they are not a member of NATO. They don't get those special privileges and benefits of oil, of trade, and all these different things because they're not a member. Then they say that you Ukraine is able to trade elsewhere right now, but it's simply not true because if Ukraine was able to, 
they're not allowed to because they're too scared of Russia harming them if they switch to another source of oil. I mean, Russia's making tons of money off of them. They need to keep them in uh, with Ukraine. Then NATO would be protecting them. Even if Russia tries to retaliate, they have the entirety of NATO to defend them. In the last time that Russia cut off oil, Ukraine went through an economic recession. So it's quite clear here, Judge, that if you want to save the economy of Ukraine, you want to prevent Ukraine from being taken over by Russia right now, the only side to be voting for is on behalf of the affirmation. Thank you. Okay, so I have a minute left to cross, so I'm starting my time now. Okay, so you talk about how Ukraine is going to have more access to trade when the special privileges of when they join NATO. But is it correct that NATO isn't a trade alliance? It's a military defense, like you say yourself. So what would specifically be changing in terms of trade? NATO is an alliance against Russia. That was the entire intent of creating NATO. So anything that opposes Russia is the point of NATO. If that includes trade, then that is one of the benefits that Ukraine would be receiving. If that right, includes but, military, then that would also be military aid. But but there's nothing that's specifically within the NATO alliance that would uh, add more trade benefits than what would already exist in Ukraine because they're not a trade alliance. So what exactly is changing? No, the countries that are a part of NATO, though there's no written agreement, because they have this already pre-established relationship, there's a higher likelihood of trade occurring between them okay. because they know that they need these different necessities. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have eight minutes. So if everybody is ready, I'll start my time in three, two, one. Hello, Judge Day, Sam, on the firmest negation of today's debate. So really quick, before I want to start to today's debate, the affirmation is essentially collapsed on net benefits. They say who can prevent the death of more people should be winning today's debate. Now, the negation is inherently winning the side of net benefits because the negation is avoiding a war entirely. Now, let's go on to our case. So the first point we talk about is about escalated tensions. We see that the point that they brought up within their constructive case about how Russia has escalated tensions because because they're adding troops to the border. That actually happened because Ukraine put a bid into NATO. Now, this point went completely unaddressed. The fact that uh, the real reason that tensions have been escalating with Russia and Ukraine recently is because of the threat of Ukraine joining NATO. Should Ukraine actually join NATO? We know that the escalation of this war and the use of con uh, Ukraine conflict in the Crimea region will re-spark, rekindle, causing more deaths. We, as the negation, avoid the rekindling of this conflict, and thus we prevent deaths, uh, deaths from happening. Now, we tell you that Russia's foreign ministry spokesperson gave a reason for the country's moves at the beginning of the military buildup. She said that Ukraine's bid for NATO membership could entail uh, could be ha have uh, irreversible conflicts for Ukraine's statehood. We also tell you that uh, uh, Russia is willing to use military force to achieve preventing uh, to achieve a. a, a, a aggression after Ukraine actually joins NATO. So we see that military uh, uh, military tensions actually rise under the affirmations plan once the uh, once Ukraine joins NATO. Instead, uh, in the status quo, uh, uh, in before Ukraine put a bid in to join NATO, a lot of the tensions in this region had actually de-escalated. Now, Today, Ukraine is not only a security recipient, but has uh, been a security donor in the region. And Ukraine has been successful in countering Russian aggression for almost seven years now. That's according to Carnegie Europe. We also see that uh, we see that if we don't end the escalate tensions, we don't see a buildup. Uh, we don't see a buildup in the threat for this war actually even happening in the first place. And we see that Russia uh, and we see that Ukraine has been able to defend itself pretty well, especially with U uh, the U.S.'s aid that we've been giving to Ukraine. So the idea that like uh, uh, work, the war is inevitable and that their side solves better simply isn't true. The war isn't inevitable. The war is inevitable if we pass the affirmations plan and Ukraine joins uh, and Ukraine joins, joins NATO. Now Russia said this themselves. So okay. They basically, they also said that oh tensions are increasing. The negation is doing nothing to address the rising tensions. Again. 
tensions are happening because Ukraine put a bid in to join NATO. We see that you at the point where Russia is literally telling us that they will use military force if uh, Ukraine joins NATO, we see that like a uh, uh, preventing Ukraine from joining NATO, preventing these tensions from escalating in the first place is the best way that we can uphold net benefits in today's debate. Now, they tried to refute this by saying that, oh, we basically conceded Russia doesn't want uh, Ukraine to join NATO because they know they'll have this like massive uh, uh, retaliation against Russia. Now, the reason why Ukraine doesn't, uh, why Russia doesn't want Ukraine to join NATO is not because they're scared of the military retaliation. It's because it's been a historical piece of uh, uh, it's been a historical piece of land that's strategic for trade, right? Not because they're scared of the retaliation against NATO, but because it's a strategic place for them, right? And the, the reason they say themselves is because uh, it would have the consequences for Ukraine's statehood. They want Ukraine to be a state within Russia. They don't want, uh, they don't, they're not scared of the retaliation. Um, okay. So uh, our second point was about a detriment to NATO and how they would be have to fully focus on the Russo-Ukraine conflict instead of other things that would benefit uh, NATO. They basically said, oh, you weigh this against saving lives. First of all, we're saving lives by preventing the, uh, the aggression from rising in the first place. You're literally the ones who are causing the aggression, causing the increased tensions. And also, uh, uh, they say that, uh, uh, and also, it's not just about saving lives versus uh, uh, focusing on uh, economics. We see that if the entirety of NATO, they, if they have to spend all of their political capital focused on this one conflict, you're essentially involving the United States, the United Kingdom, and now Russia in a in a potential uh, in a potential war. These are three major nuclear powers. We want to have by all means prevent a conflict from rising. This idea of saving lives and retaliating against Russia really isn't a good idea when you recognize that the powers within NATO literally now have nuclear weapons. We're basically starting, uh, it has the potential to escalate, uh, uh, to escalate tensions, escalate the harms, and thus they cause more deaths in the long run. Okay, so now let's go on to their case. The first point they bring up is of safety, and they talk about how the uh, military, uh, how the tensions have been rising, and they're, for, uh, uh, they're willing to impose military force. Again, this happened because there was a bid to join NATO. They basically not addressed this point that we brought up in our constructive speech at all, right? Um, so the very examples that they give go against their case. They also say that, uh, oh, we also tell you that Russia historically has not listened to NATO. They don't, even if uh, even if Ukraine joins NATO, historically, Russia isn't very scared of it. Uh, first of all, uh, this point went unrefuted. Russia does not cooperate with NATO. NATO invited Russia to cooperate on missile defense, uh, 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 missile defense, uh, and, and like Russia to refuse to cooperate and rejected dialogue uh, on the issue of the use of uh, use of in conflict in uh, 2013, uh, and ultimately uh, uh, Russia's statements threatened to target allies because of NATO's ballistic missile defense. Um, so we see that Russia isn't actually scared of NATO, uh, so they don't actually solve for this point, even if uh, you don't actually solve for this point. Uh, we also tell you that, like, uh, they say that the West can't do anything in the status quo. That's not true. We tell you that the U.S. is already giving aid to Ukraine. Ukraine has already been able to prevent a war, prevent escalated tensions, because the United States is able to give aid to Ukraine in the status quo. This point has basically gone unrefuted. We also tell you that Ukraine thus far in the past seven years before this bid to join NATO, they've been able to defend themselves. If we escalate tensions, escalate conflict, and escalate the amount of arms that are now going to be uh, uh, crossing between Ukraine and Russia, uh, it, it gives Ukraine a, a smaller chance to, uh, a smaller ability to defend themselves in the long run. Now, let's go on to, uh, uh, they basically say that um, Russia, uh, Ukraine will become more safe, and that this war is inevitable. But again, Ukraine was already safe, right? All they're doing is increasing the chance that we have a war between the US, UK, and Russia, which is basically, uh, a, you, you have the probability of doomsday, right? It's these like three major nuclear powers that now have the chance of being at war with each other. This is not a good impact. Now let's go on to the point about oil, because uh, essentially what they've said is that Ukraine will now have a better ability to trade with NATO. Um, let's. There's a couple responses to this. Number one, Ukraine already has the ability to trade with other nations. Uh, NATO is not a trade alliance. NATO is a defense military alliance. There's no special privileges that Ukraine gets from joining NATO in terms of trading. They already have the full ability to trade. Now, 
uh, if you don't buy that, they go on to talk about Russian involvement and how Russia or Ukraine doesn't have the ability to trade because Russia will retaliate against them if they stop trading. Now, again, we tell you that they don't solve for this because we tell you that Russia doesn't even listen, uh, doesn't listen to NATO at all, right? This point has, again, gone completely unrefuted in today's debate. Russia has a historical standing of not actually cooperating with NATO on balance. We see that Russia as a whole does not care whether or not you, uh, does not care uh, uh, and is not scared of the retaliation against NATO. Uh, for those reasons, I firmly negate. Thank you. All right, I'd like to take a question in cross X. Oh, I think, okay, yeah, but I think you only have like 15 seconds left, right? Because oh, you, I mean, you can just ask one quick question, but, and I'll answer it, but. No, nah, you're good, you're good. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So, judges, my roadmap for this speech is going to be a couple of observations about the debate as a whole and then um, voter issues. Um, okay. Great. So, I will start my time in three, two, and one. Hello, Judge. My partner and I stand on the firmest negation of the resolution resolved. NATO should, should admit Ukraine as a member state. Judge, a couple of observations. First, what has gone conceded in this debate, throughout this debate, is that in the status quo, tensions have de-escalated. For seven years before Ukraine put in a bid for NATO, tensions had de-escalated and had quelled themselves. What happened uh, recently? What happened when Ukraine put in that NATO bid? They got 100,000 troops put on that border. So what we see here is that the affirmation is advocating for a tried system, right? Like we've already seen Russia's response to when uh, uh, NATO is involved in this kind of situation. They do not want Ukraine to be a part of NATO. So what we see here is that the affirmation is actively escalating this conflict, actively causing more deaths, actively leading to more Russian aggression. So conceded in this debate has gone the fact that tensions had quelled themselves and are actually back to a place where they are no longer as high as the affirmation wants to make them out to be. And what we see is that the affirmation actually makes those worse. But second judge, a massive point goes conceded in today's debate, and that is about nuclear proliferation. When you involve uh, four nuclear powers in a military conflict, right, at that point, you have massive potential for widespread war and massive death right? This point never goes addressed by the affirmation in today's debate. The idea that when we, uh, when Ukraine is admitted into NATO, NATO is now involved in this conflict that is inevitably going to be violent, inev inevitably going to be uh, military, we will see the proliferation of a nuclear conflict. This point goes unconceded into, or sorry, goes conceded in today's debate. They simply do not address this point. This is a massive, massive harm and a massive impact, a negative impact on the affirmation. But third judge, the point about the economy. NATO is not a trade alliance, as my partner brings up. So this idea that Ukraine being involved in NATO is going to increase its trade volume, first of all, that doesn't stand because it is a defense alliance, a strategic military alliance. This has nothing to do with the economy. But second, in the status quo, Ukraine still has the ability to trade for oil and gas with other countries, right? Trade still can exist in the status quo. This point also goes unaddressed. But further, the affirmation destroys the Ukrainian economy. What we have seen historically is that war devastates economies. And what we point out in our case is that Ukraine is currently the poorest country in Europe. So when you involve them in an, in, in, in an inevitable uh, war and an inevitable conflict, with Russia because of the affirmations plan, we destroy the Ukrainian economy, which is already suffering. So now we go into a couple of voter issues, Judge. Why do you vote against the affirmation? Why do you vote against all out all out war? First, Judge, you vote on the fact that military tensions with Russia 
are going to escalate inevitably. The very reason why there have been tensions recently is because this bid for NATO was put in. Russia will only do military intervention in the event of NATO being involved. When we don't admit Ukraine into NATO, that is when we avoid this conflict. That is what the negation is advocating for. The affirmation is literally going to cause thousands and thousands of more deaths. It is going to repeat the Russo-Ukrainian War of 2014, right? They're going to destroy this country and is going to cause widespread death. But second judge, you vote on the fact that the economy of Ukraine will be in shambles when this massive war takes place, right? Because this country is already suffering economically. And the second massive point that you vote on, or the third point you vote on judge, is the idea that when NATO is involved in this conflict, we will inevitably have a massive nuclear conflict, a massive, massive harm on the affirmation, considering there will be four nuclear powers involved. This will be a massive of harm, massive death will come out of it. The affirmation does not meet the standard of net benefits. For all of these reasons, you vote on the negation. Thank you. All right. I have one last fall bill speech and I will get started short shortly. Okay, there we go. All right, so once again, this will be the last speech in today's debate. We, once again, we are the affirmative and this will be my last five minute speech. Uh, as a brief off time roadmap, I will be doing an overview on this debate, then I'm gonna be talking about one key issue in the debate and then moving on to Wayne. All right, with that, my time starts now. My opponents and I agree on a lot of things. We agree that Russia currently wants to take over Ukraine and make it part of its own country. We also agree that Russia is angry about Ukraine trying to join NATO. The question that you want to ask yourself at the end of the day, judges, is, who is going to be the one that saves the most lives in a world where Ukraine joins NATO or in a world where Ukraine doesn't join NATO, which is the status quo? Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is Russian aggression. My opponent's entire case functions on this one fact. If Ukraine joins NATO, then Russia will attack. Here is the problem. They concede a couple of the biggest warrants on our contention which tell you that right now, if we do nothing, Russia will attack Ukraine without NATO even being in the picture. Let's go over them. One, Russia has been seizing ships and in the Ukrainian harbors and killing sailor, sailors as of April, 2021. Two, the biggest thing that they drop is that this. In 2014, Russia went into Ukraine and annexed the entire territory of Crimea. They took over that territory because they believe that it belonged to them rightfully as Russia. This proves judges more than a shadow of a doubt that you, Russia will do everything in its power. It will use its military, it will kill soldiers, it will commit blatant human rights violations if it can get its territory back from Ukraine. This is the problem. Any little thing that sets Russia off will cause them to go into Ukraine. And that I'm not talking about NATO. I'm talking about Ukraine just living its life on a day-to-day -day basis. Ultimately, my opponents are not addressing the root cause of the issue, which is this. Russia doesn't want Ukraine to join NATO because they know that NATO has a history of defeating Russia. And they don't want Ukraine to join because if Ukraine joins NATO, they will beat back Russia and win. Judges, let me refer to you to my first speech. I give you examples on how NATO was able to save countries from Russia. For example, Bosnia was saved in 1995. Another one was saved in 1999, Kosnovo, right? All of these are examples on how when NATO steps in, they are able to effectively protect countries from Russian aggression. This is exactly what happens in the affirmative world. Yes. Maybe Russia gets mad that there is this big NATO alliance that Ukraine is joining, but here is the problem. Even if Russia is mad enough to start a war, they will not. 
Why? Because like we keep repeating over and over in this debate, Russia is too scared of the 30 countries which make up the entire NATO alliance than they are of just one tiny little puny Ukraine trying to beat them back. My opponent's only response to this is that, oh, well, maybe the United States is giving Ukraine aid right now, and maybe that's helping them. And I ask you this, if the United States' military was so effective, then why was Russia able to annex Crimea? Why is Russia still able to kill soldiers? It's because this one country is not enough to fight back Ukraine Russian aggression. Finally, my opponents say Russia will not cooperate with NATO and Russia will not cooperate with Ukraine. This is not our point. We do not say that NATO and Russia will cooperate. We are saying that NATO scares Russia into submission. This is why we won the Cold War. This is why NATO wins every time they go against Russia in these tiny little countries. It's because NATO has the military power. NATO is able to provide troops to Ukraine to effectively beat back Russia. Finally, my opponents say that Ukraine can simply trade with other countries in the status quo. But I remind you one final time that the reason that Ukraine is currently not trading with other countries in NATO, outside of NATO, it doesn't matter, is because they are scared of Russia. Do you want to live in a world where Ukraine can just, at a moment's notice, Russia can just pull out their oil supply and Ukraine will be left defenseless? Or a world where Ukraine already has pre-existing connections with these countries and will foster economic alliances against them. Let's go to a world view world comparison. In the NED world, Ukraine is defenseless against inevitable Russian attack and defeat will be swift, just as it was with the 13,000 that died when Russia did the same to Crimea. In the AF world, the probability of war is extremely low because we already tell you Ukraine has now 30 states backing them up and the US to defend them. Judges, it is a try or die situation. And at the end of the day, it is clear that if we want to avoid a war, foster peace, foster new economic alliances, and just ultimately restore diplomacy to Ukraine, we need to vote for the F. Thank you.